Well, good morning, church family. Good morning. morning. Um, obviously, you can see things are a little different than normal this morning. Uh, <laughs> this, is, uh, this is how we can make it work. So I remember back when I was uh, first told about I would have the, the surgery and uh, thinking about how this would line up with our already planned summer in the Psalms. Um, I remember telling Pastor Luke, I, I don't know how I'll be up here and preach, but I'll make it happen. If you have to wheel me out in a hospital bed, uh, we'll do, do that. And it uh, turns out this is a better situation than that. So anyways, we're, we're making do. Hopefully it's not too distracting. I try to put a sock on my toes. So you don't have to look at it. But um, yeah, so <laughs> I apologize. But last week, uh, Pastor Ryan, he did kick us off with this new sermon series called Summer in the Psalms. And, and I just have to tell you guys just right off the bat that like, the Psalms are a wonderful place for me uh, when I'm, I'm not sure where to turn in Scripture. It's kind of like my, my main uh, place of, uh, you know, source of inspiration, if you will. It, it doesn't really matter what emotion I'm feeling, whether it's anger, fear, or just joy. There's a Psalm uh, to speak to each of our emotions. And, and, and actually, it's kind of in line with what uh, Ryan said last week. I, I was taking some notes. He said the motivating factor for this series, that Psalms are honest and real about the human experience, right? And so it's definitely going to be the case this morning as well. Uh, a, a different experience from last week for sure. And uh, as I was taking notes, one of the things I, th- I thought was interesting, uh, I wrote it down at least, was that I learned that Ryan didn't learn how to ride a bike until he was 22, which I thought was really interesting. Uh, that's kind of crazy, but I'm not throwing shade. That's just interesting. Uh, some of the other notes I took, some more serious ones, um, was that he was talking about wisdom, right? And he was, he was pointing us to wisdom in Jesus, and that th- the wisdom that we find in Jesus ought to lead us to placing our faith in Jesus. And uh, I really appreciated that from Psalm 1 last week. And so I will again tell you, you know, right out of the gate here, that this psalm is going to be shockingly different uh, from last week. And so if, uh, if you're looking for a feel-good experience, I'll, I'll try to provide a little bit of that for you, but I'll just tell you that this is a difficult psalm uh, as we're going to go through this. And uh, I can promise you the very least that we will point to Jesus, right? And so all, all scripture is about Jesus. It's, it's all pointing toward him, and, and so we'll do that this morning as well. But the psalm that we're going to be looking at here this morning is probably the clearest representation in all of Scripture of what I would call an imprecatory psalm. And an imprecatory psalm, that, that might not sound super familiar to you, but if, if you don't know what that means, uh, it, it's essentially a psalm that calls for God to have justice done on the earth. It's calling God to enact justice on the wicked. And maybe even more plainly or accurately is that it's almost a demand, right, for God's anger, his destruction to be poured out upon the the psalmist's enemies. And guys, I I just want to point out that there are certainly texts that are difficult in the Bible, uh, as maybe you're doing your own quiet times that you're not sure There's texts that are difficult for me to preach, right, or to read on my own, but upon reflection as we read through this text this morning, I want to share with you uh, Charles Spurgeon, his sentiment about this psalm. I couldn't agree more. He says, truly, this is one of the hard places in scripture, a passage which the soul trembles to read, yet as it is a psalm unto God, And given by inspiration, it is not ours to sit in judgment upon it, but to bow our ear to what God, the Lord, would speak to us therein. And so, trying to couch this with some warning for you guys, but with that warning in mind, uh, will you join me this morning in prayer before we begin? Dear Heavenly Father, God, we're just so thankful for your word God, we're thankful for how it inspires us, encourages us, and God, sometimes challenges us. And so this morning, God, as we open one of those difficult places in your word to understand, God, I pray that our ears will be open. God, that your spirit, even now that resides in our hearts, will begin to stir us toward what it is you have for us today, that that you want us to get out of this this morning. And so God, just... Let us put aside our own thoughts. 
God, and allow you to work this morning. We just ask all this in your name. Amen. So when Ryan and I began planning this series for, for quite some time back, um, we, we did kind of put it off a little bit. You know, well, next week we'll figure it out, and then, you know, we've got a bunch of other stuff we've got to plan, and we'll, we'll do it next week. And, and eventually we settled on doing the summer in the Psalms, uh, which, which I, I'm really excited about. But we pr- pretty quickly decided that if we're going to do the Psalms, maybe the best way to go about this six or s- it turned into seven weeks um, is to maybe choose different genres of psalms, right? To, to, to try to get uh, different representations, maybe the best representation of each of these different genres that we see in the psalms. And one of the categories that came up uh, is imprecatory psalms. And I'm not at all ashamed to tell you guys that I very quickly claimed uh, this one for myself to preach to you all this morning. Um, there are all sorts of different personality types out there, and uh, I will tell you that if you know me for very long, you will know that I'm the kind of person who loves justice, just love to see justice done in this world. Uh, and, and maybe uh, one of the earliest examples that I remember in my own life of this, where this desire for justice really reared its head in my life, was uh, I was on a car trip with my family, and, and maybe many of you guys, this might be relatable to you as well, uh, I think many families experience this, but we were driving back from, from somewhere, a long car trip. I don't know where. Again, it was a long time ago. But my dad was driving, uh, me and my, my sister, my mom, and there was this car on the road uh, that was just not driving the way we thought he ought to drive, right? And so every time we try to pass him, he would speed up, uh, you know, making gestures out the window and things like that. And, and then eventually my dad would just calm down. He'd, he'd just get back over and, and wait. And the guy would slow down in front of us. And eventually my dad would get tired. He'd try to speed up around the guy and he'd speed up again, right? Familiar story, I'm sure, to many of you. However, uh, as, as this went on and on, my dad would get more vocal, right, about his uh, displeasure at this uh, other car. And eventually this other car uh, sped up real fast, right? He was, he was tired of us. We were tired of him. He decided to probably hit triple digits on his odometer, and, and he was gone, right? Like a speedometer, not the odometer. Speedometer, yeah, he was gone. And I will say that a few minutes later, uh, my family kind of toning down the, the anger, and we see some blue lights up ahead. And my dad, you know, getting ready to see, hopefully it's this guy that we've been so struggling with this whole way. And what I can tell you is that we got closer, we saw that it was indeed that car that's been so annoying this whole time, right? And immediately in the car, there's just like an eruption of of cheers, right? We're so excited that this guy got what he deserved. Finally, God, somebody got what they deserved, right? And my dad, uh, he unrolled the window, and we didn't have the push-down ones. You had to roll it down, and, and he's shouting out the window, you know, something to make this guy feel even worse about his day. And, and we all felt good, right? There's something just feels good when that happens. My YouTube algorithm is very much the same. Uh, you guys know that dash cams exist, and so often YouTube will recommend videos to me of instant justice where somebody will go through a red light, and right around the corner is a cop who instantly pulls him over, and it just makes my heart feel right when I see those videos, right? Is it, I don't think I'm alone. Is there anybody else? Like, yeah, we love justice. And, and guys, I think many of us feel the same way because I believe that we're all made in the same image of God. And that's actually my first point for you here this morning as we're about to get into the text, is that our desire for justice is a reflection of the character of God. Will you turn with me uh, to Psalm 109 as we begin in the first five verses here? It says, Be not silent, O God of my praise, for wicked and deceitful mouths are opened against me, speaking against me with lying tongues. They encircle me with words of hate and attack me without cause. In return for my love, they accuse me, but I give myself to prayer. So they reward me evil for good and hatred for my love. If you look at the top of this chapter here, it should tell you that this psalmist is indeed David. And he finds himself in a situation I'm sure most of you have experienced before. 
And the situation that I'm referring to is one in which our enemies are not silent, but God seems to be. I sometimes find myself looking through old, uh, the Old Testament parts of that that I think to myself, man, I really wish sometimes that God would be as vocal and as evident today as he was then. Why is it that sometimes God seems to give evil no room to operate And other times, it's like open season on God's people. To that, I tell you, church, I don't have a definitive answer. I wish I could tell you I have this great theological point to tell you that that really solves this for you and helps you move on, but I can't even attempt it, right? Because I can't fathom God's ways. All I know is that David found himself in this exact situation that I myself have felt many times in my own life. And so David, in these verses, he describes the kind of enemy that he's facing. These enemies are the kind that return love with hate, truth with lies. These enemies encircle David to try to trap him. Why would God allow this? A common refrain that you'll find in the Psalms is, how long, O Lord? How long? Our desire for justice isn't always just inwardly focused, right? It's not always selfish. Pastor Luke already referred to this, but I'm sure many of you guys, as you turned on your televisions last night and saw what had happened to our former president, maybe you were like me, moved to cry out to God, how long, O Lord, will you allow this evil that we see in our generation to continue? But there's another part of me that feels guilty when I have these fleeting thoughts of demands for justice. We almost feel bad that we would wish evil would receive the justice that it's due. But I do want to encourage you this morning, church, as as we look at these, these verses, that your desire for justice comes from being made in the image of God. Because God desires justice in this world, you desire justice. Who can forget all the many times in the Old Testament, the New Testament, when God makes an example out of those who would, who would commit evil acts? He doesn't let it go unchecked. And God's just, justice is indeed a theme that we see throughout the entire Bible, from beginning to end, and, and I know that we do read in Scripture, right, that, that God is slow to anger, right, and abounding in steadfast love. But I want you to notice, church, that it doesn't say that God is without anger. He's slow to anger. I do want to warn you guys that there are two dangers uh, that you could fall into as we, as we go through this passage here, as we continue with this psalm. And some of you will be tempted to one extreme or the other, There's two positions here, and the first one that you could fall into is to reject this text altogether because this psalm does not reflect or mesh with your current view of a nice God. I will say that there's been a very successful campaign in the most recent decades to really play down God's justice and and play up his, his love. Maybe there's a lot of people who've convinced themselves, right, that in the end, this loving God who loves unconditionally, perhaps that kind of God couldn't really, could he really allow people to go to hell forever, to be separated from him? Maybe in the end, everyone will be forgiven. God is so nice that he couldn't possibly do that, right? I just want to warn you guys that this tame and neutered version of God is not the God that we see in the Bible. It's actually an idol that you've set up in place of the God that's really presented here in Scripture. And I don't want you to hear me wrong. I'm not denying that God is love. Unequivocally and beyond comprehension, God is unconditionally loving. But to the same extreme, he's also just need to abandon any notion of a warm and fuzzy teddy bear theology where God is just a nice guy. 
A second danger that you could fall into as you read a psalm like this is that you could actually use it to justify your own anger, the issues, that, the struggles that you have. Just because God's justice is real does not mean that you reflect that perfectly. Right? We can all remember when Jesus went into the temple and he was flipping tables, displaying a righteous anger at what was being done. But his righteous anger was still very much in line with his love. I doubt that that is the case when a guy cuts you off in traffic, right? And you have some righteous anger. That's not righteous anger. We must be careful not to use the language that we see in this psalm to justify the evil that's waiting inside of us. We'll address this more later, but as we continue with this psalm, what I want you to focus on as we we see these next few verses is to pay particularly close attention to how evil affects others. Let's pick up in verse 6 here. He says, "Appoint Appoint a wicked man against him. Let an accuser stand at his right hand. When he is tried, let him come forth guilty. Let his prayer be counted as sin. May his days be few. May another take his office. May his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. May his children wander about and beg, seeking food far from the ruins they inhabit. May the creditor seize all that he has. May strangers plunder the fruits of his toil. Let there be none to extend kindness to him, nor any to pity his fatherless children. May his posterity be cut off. May his name be blotted out in the second generation. May the iniquity of his fathers be remembered before the Lord, and let not the sin of his mother be blotted out. Let them be before the Lord continually, that he may cut off the memory of them from the earth. I told you guys this wasn't going to be easy. I understand that this is not a comfortable read. I read this psalm out loud to my dad uh, last week. And uh, as I was going through some of these verses, I noticed his eyes are getting wider and wider. And, and his reaction at the end was probably the same as you, is that's in the Bible? So much of this psalm makes our sensible, you know, modern stomachs turn. Now is probably a good time to point out to you guys that this psalm is sometimes referred to as the Judas psalm or the Iscariot psalm. I'll let you put those two together. You know who we're talking about. If verse 8 sounds familiar to you, it's because Peter actually quoted this, right? When it came time to replace Judas, the guy who betrayed Jesus and and is no longer with the 12 for, for reasons that are given in Scripture, we see that Judas' days were indeed numbered. They were few, and another did take his office. But I know that as I try to do my own daily quiet times, right, and I, I go to the scriptures, oftentimes I'm looking for the scripture to make me feel good. But reading the Bible and studying it isn't always about making you feel good. Sometimes we're needing to go to the Bible to just simply understand the truth. Sometimes that's enough. And one of those truths that we learn here, a a harsh truth, is that our wickedness affects others. Part of what makes us particularly uncomfortable with these verses is that David is not simply asking for justice to be done to the perpetrator of all these evil acts but upon the perpetrator's parents and his children as well. I think most of us have seen how sin can affect more than just the sinner, right? Uh, I often think of sin like we're all floating on top of water, right? And, and someone sins, they throw a rock, right, into the water, and, and the ripples begin to extend out from where the rock landed, and, and we all feel the consequences of the sin. But what we need to remember is that those that are closest to the person who threw the rock, often feel the the strongest waves. Maybe you understand this intrinsically, right? Maybe you have an alcoholic in your family. Maybe you have somebody who's struggling with a mental disorder or, or a wayward child. I don't know what you're experiencing, but we all know that there's sin in our families, right? And we all experience the, the ripple effect of that sin in our life. 
whatever the case may be, sins never occur in a vacuum. And they usually have far-reaching consequences. I do want to caution you guys. We need to approach these verses with humility. I can hear the groans as we, we finish these, these verses, and, and I feel the same way. As I was thinking about these verses, I can't imagine myself wishing these things upon my worst enemy, right? Like, why, why would I wish these things upon somebody's child when the child hasn't done anything to me? This is very difficult. But we do see that in Scripture, sin tends to be generational. The sins that you struggle with, mom or dad, are going to be the same sins that your children are going to have to be dealing with later on down the road. Oftentimes, that's the case. The things that you are struggling with, they see today, will be things that they struggle with down the road. I'm going to quote Charles Spurgeon once again. I, I thought some of the things that he said about this psalm were exactly how I was feeling as I read through this. And so, a lengthy quote here, but he said this, those who regard a sort of effeminate benevolence to all creatures alike as the acme of virtue are much in favor with this degenerate age. These look for the salvation of the damned and even pray for the restoration of the devil. It is very possible that if they were less in sympathy with evil and more in harmony with the thoughts of God, they would be of a far sterner and also of a far better mind. To us, it seems better to agree with God's curses than with the devil's blessings. And when at any time our heart kicks against the terrors of the Lord, we take it as proof of our need of greater humbling and confess our sins before our God. He goes on to say this. We confess that as we read some of these verses, we have need of all our faith and reverence to accept them as the voice of inspiration. But the exercise is good for the soul, for it educates our sense of ignorance and tests our teachability. Yes, divine spirit, we can and do believe that even these dread words which we read, which we shrink from, have a meaning consistent with the attributes of the judge of all the earth, though his name is love. How this may be, we shall know hereafter. I have to echo that sentiment, as Charles Spurgeon so eloquently put it, that even if I can't perfectly understand these verses and how they mesh with my current view of God and who he is, I can indeed acknowledge that God is both just and loving and that one day in glory I will understand that a little better. So David goes on to describe in greater detail here what he's experiencing, starting in verse 16. He says, For he did not remember to show kindness, but pursued the poor and needy and the brokenhearted to put them to death. He loved to curse. Let curses come upon him. He did not delight in blessing. May it be far from him. He clothed himself with cursing as his coat. May it soak into his body like water, like oil into his bones. May it be like a garment that he wraps around himself, like a belt that he puts on every day. May this be the reward of my accusers from the Lord, of those who speak evil against my life. Evil seems to be encouraged when it goes unpunished, right? It seems like if if they can get away with an inch, they'll take a mile. And this is the kind of evil that we see here from this man in the psalm who doesn't just neglect the needy, but it says he actually actively is putting them to death. We may cringe, right, as we we read the psalmist ask for God to curse this man's children, but the evil that this man is hurling curses upon, it's exactly what the psalmist is asking. Nothing more or less than for the curses that he is hurling to come back upon him, his own self. These are the kinds of things that he's wishing on other people. Oftentimes, this is thought of as karma. I'm not doing karma here, right? This is divine retribution. God sees this man's evil, and the psalmist is just asking for his evil to come back upon himself. 
And I think sometimes we think that God might miss some of the smaller evils that, that we notice, right? And, and, and we were tempted to remind him, God, I hope you don't miss, you know, what Aunt Sally did. She, she took that, extra, that last piece of cake at Thanksgiving and she didn't need it. Right, and we think that maybe God needs reminding. But God's scales are perfect. He sees everything, right? His justice will not miss a single detail. I understand that evil is often done in the shadows, right? In darkness. You don't see all the evil, but God does. I will admit that even to this point, I'm still feeling a tension, right? between my current understanding of who God is and, and some of these verses. And, and you're not alone if you feel that way. But this does actually lead into my next point, and hopefully this will help us take a turn here, which is that we are still called to love our enemies. We're still called to love our enemies. How can a Christian properly understand these verses, right, in light of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount? How can we synthesize these imp- imprecations, right, with what we read in Matthew chapter 5 when Jesus said, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Christian, I want you to understand this morning here that evil is very real. And we are in the midst of spiritual warfare. There is a very real enemy out there who wants you to be destroyed not figuratively, literally destroyed in every way he can. The Bible tells us the enemy is prowling around like a lion, seeking who he may devour. And that same enemy is at work in this world, leading billions of souls away from God into eternal separation from him. We need to know who the real enemy is. David wrote the psalm, right? Remember David who was constantly persecuted, pursued by Saul, who on many occasions attempted to assassinate, right, his his political rival, was David. And David, we see throughout Scripture, was given several opportunities, right, to, to take matters into his own hands. He could have maybe convinced himself even that God had delivered Saul into his hand, right? Saul was sleeping and David was able to take the spear. Another time, Saul went into a cave and David was able to to take off part of his his cloak there. But David, even throughout that temptation, did not strike. David understood who his enemy was. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 makes this very clear for us. It says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And I want you to know this morning that God is the God of justice both in the spiritual realm and the physical realm. And David trusted that God would handle both. Both. And we need to do the same. We sometimes separate these two, right, in our prayer. And and so we recognize that there's spiritual warfare. And so we'll say, God, take care of the spiritual side and I'll do this over here on my own and take care of the physical side. No. Need to remember that God is sovereign over both realms. I understand that it's never more difficult to pray for people than when they're actively persecuting you, but that's what we're called to do. And we need to remember that we too were once in darkness. Pastor Luke referred to this earlier just a few verses in uh, Ephesians before in chapter 5, he said, Paul says this, For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. With proper perspective, we can pray for our enemies because we understand they are blind and they do not know what they do. Does that sound familiar? hope so. We need to follow the example that Jesus set on the cross, right? As he forgave those who were leading him unwittingly to the cross, he was their only chance of redemption. This world is full of darkness, and it only seems to be increasing. If we do not prepare our hearts right now, we'll not be ready 
right, when that temptation comes to follow the Lord's example. A lot of us want to exact justice on the Lord's behalf. We see evil and we're like, God, I'll take care of it. Put me in the game, coach. I'll, I'll, I'll take care of it. We think we can help God by destroying some of his enemies. But this brings me to my next point, is that vengeance is mine, declares the Lord. Let's pick back up in verse 21. David says, But you, O God, my Lord, deal on my behalf for your name's sake, because your steadfast love is good, deliver me. For I am poor and needy, and my heart is stricken within me. I am gone like a shadow at evening. I am shaken off like a locust. My knees are weak through fasting. My body has become gaunt with no fat. I am an object of scorn to my accusers. When they see me, they wag their heads. Help me, O Lord my God. Save me according to your steadfast love. Let them know that this is your hand. You, O Lord, have done it. Let them curse, but you will bless. They will rise and put to shame, but your servant will be glad. May my accusers be clothed with dishonor. May they be wrapped in their own shame as in a cloak. I don't know about you, but some of my favorite passages in all of Scripture contain the words, but God. This passage is no different. We've seen how wicked David's enemies are, and we've seen what David is asking God to do. But it does take a pretty sharp turn here in verse 21. And as I looked and contemplated at this verse, I saw that David was not just asking God to do something on his behalf because he'd earned it or for some merit, but simply for the Lord's own name, for his sake. David does not appeal to God because of who he as a man is or because of how evil his enemies are, but because of who God is. You know who hates sin more than David? Who hates the sin of David's enemies more than David? It's God. You may think you understand how much God hates sin, but you can never fathom the depths of God's wrath toward evil. God and evil are simply unable to coexist. Either evil, evil will be dealt justice or God is not who he says he is. And that's exactly what David is saying here. He understands that God will do what is right in his own time and in his own way because, of course, he will. It's who he is. We see the prescription to this problem of evil in Romans. Chapter 12, starting in verse 17, it says this, Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink, for by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This principle comes all the way back from Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 35. It's not a new thing. It's consistent throughout the entire Bible. And we, like David, need to understand rightly that we are not meant to be out there like some vigilante Batman, right, who's roaming around the streets taking care of all the injustices we see. God doesn't need our help on that. We need to trust that God is in control. We talk about this all the time here at church. It almost seems like a you know, broken record, but we need to be reminded of it. God is in control, and he's the one who's going to make things right. Our job is to overcome evil with good, to turn the other cheek, to love our enemies. And when I think about that, it, it, it makes me recoil a little bit. I don't like it. I'm not asking you to let people walk all over you. Never defend yourself. But what I am saying is that many of us are pretty eager to defend ourselves. I want you to remember that Jesus did not open his mouth, right, as he was led to the cross. 
like a, a sheep to the slaughter. It is right for us. We ought to defend our loved ones. And I'm not suggesting we do otherwise, but I am asking you to consider where does God fit into your calculus? Is he part of the equation? Or do you kind of tack him on the end and say that you trust him only once the danger has passed? I know that for myself, as I was scrolling through Twitter last night, I uh, probably do that too much, but I, I saw many posts, right? A lot of fearful and angry people. There's a lot of unrest out there in this world, and the media doesn't help, right? They keep throwing logs onto the fire. They're going to they're gonna keep stoking that fire as long as they can. And it almost seems like we're never given a chance to breathe, right? In this constant news cycle where they're telling us who we're supposed to hate or fear, This brings me to my final point this morning here, which is that trusting Jesus brings peace. Trusting Jesus brings peace. Let's finish out this psalm, starting back in verse 30. David says, With my mouth I will give great thanks to the Lord. I will praise him in the midst of the throng, for he stands at the right hand of the needy one to save him from those who condemn his soul to death. I love the end of the psalm, and do you see how David is moved to worship? How is he able to do that? Has, Has David's circumstance changed in the slightest? As far as I can tell, it does not seem to indicate that that has occurred. I think his enemies are still out there, throwing the same curses around, still encircling him to trap him. But David was honest with God. Right? Some of those verses that we read that, that make us recoil a little bit about his children or the parents, David's gotten it all off his chest. He's given everything over to the Lord. And I want to encourage you guys in your prayers to be honest with God. You're probably thinking some of those things, right? In your anger, your frustration. He already knows what's in your heart. David just simply put pen to paper and recorded it for us but he's turned it over to God. He is trusting that God will deliver justice. And this is the attitude that has driven him to worship as well as to peace. This morning, I want to ask you to consider what is it that's bothering your soul? What keeps you up late at night? What persecutions are you facing from the enemy right now? you turn them over to Jesus I can promise you this he will bring you peace I want to give you a recent example from my own life I think many of you guys can understand probably what keeps me up late at night right now I've been pretty frustrated uh, with my inability to be independent can't walk I can't drive I can't even care for my dog she's with my parents you know I can't go up and down the stairs to take her to the bathroom so She's with my parents. When I think back to the injury, I I find myself angry. My anger was mostly aimed originally at the one who did it to me. He's definitely not in the sound booth right now. And that that was the original thing, right? It was just like, man, why why was he playing like that? Like, why did this have to happen? But then I kind of reflected on it, right? And I was like, well... He's, he's a good kid. I'm sure he didn't mean to, right? There was no maliciousness there. But my anger didn't really go away. It kind of shifted from a person to, to God. I was like, God, why did you allow this to happen? What did I do to deserve this? Just last week, uh, my dad came to pick me up, uh, Isaac, uh, I don't know where he is, but yeah, he's been, he's been helping me out, get around, driving me around places since I can't drive myself, and he was actually going to go on vacation. So I called my dad after church last week, and I said, hey, come pick me up. I'll come spend some time with the family, and also you can help me not die in my apartment alone. So, so my dad came to pick me up, and um, we're getting ready to go. I'm, I'm getting all my things together, and so we're about to go pack up the car, and my dad's heading down the stairs with all my stuff, and, and he falls. 
He, he fell backwards down the stairs, about, I can't say for sure, eight to ten stairs, and he landed on concrete. And, and I just have to explain to you guys, like, I, I didn't know what to do. I'm sitting there at the top of the stairs in my crutches. I don't, I don't know what to do. And, like, just, like, one thing on top of another, you know? Like, why, why is it, like, bad things just seem to come, like, in waves, right? And just when you think you're getting a breath, right, like, another huge wave comes over your head, and you just feel like you can't breathe. And I'll tell you guys, like, I was scared, because my dad wasn't breathing at first. He was knocked unconscious. I saw a pool of blood start to, to form under him, and I was scared. And so I called 911. Can't do anything to help him. My mom's an hour away, and um, I'm struggling. I don't know what to do. And so I called 911. He starts to come to. I'm on the phone. They're sending in the ambulance, and my dad doesn't remember what happened. And then he looks at my leg, and he says, what happened to your leg, Nick? And that's when I lost it. I just I couldn't keep it together. I'm bawling my eyes out because my dad can't remember what happened. This has been a big deal. He was there for the surgery. I was home for a week after the surgery. How does he not know? And eventually, the ambulance takes him off to the hospital. I can't ride. Apparently, it's an insurance thing. And now I was left at the apartment by myself. How do I get to the hospital? I can't drive. And so I had to call and get Steve Z to come take me to the hospital, which is great. As I was waiting for Steve to come, though, I, I was sitting in the lobby of the apartment complex just angry. I was upset. Scared, but upset with God. Why did this have to happen? Why did you allow this to happen? Haven't we had enough? Like, my, mom, my mom's an hour away. I don't know what to do. I was scared, and I told God how I felt. We eventually got to the hospital, me and my mom, and they, were already, they already run the tests. He didn't have any brain bleeding. There were no fractures of his skull, which is a miracle. It's a miracle that my dad made it out the way he did. But I was still upset because earlier I hadn't trusted God. And I will tell you that as I sat in that lobby waiting for Steve to show up, I had to admit to myself that I wasn't in that moment placing my trust in God, who had already miraculously kept my dad safe from, from dying. I thought I'd watched my dad die. But at the height of my hubris, my anger, I paused. And I prayed, thanking God for protecting my dad, for being on my side, and for understanding my frustration, the pain that I was feeling in the moment. I took a deep breath, and I just gave all that weakness that I was experiencing that moment over to God. I thanked him for who he is. I handed over my fears of what might be and, and, and what ifs. And in that moment, peace that I cannot describe to you came over me. And I was able to be who I needed to be for my mom, who, as soon as I hung up with 911, I was able to call her, and, and she's freaking out. I was able to come and comfort her. And I want you guys to understand that this is exactly what David does here at the end of this psalm. I highly recommend you try it. <laughs> it helped me. I want to ask you, aren't you tired of trying to handle everything on your own. I know I am. Been humbled quite a bit recently. So as the band comes up, I need to give them some extra time so I can get off the stage, but I want to reinforce for you guys this idea that nothing and no one else can give you the peace that you so desperately need. It's only Jesus. The darkness of this world will only continue to get worse. It's not our circumstances that need to change. It's our hearts, right? Our perspective on those circumstances. And so I want to leave you with this passage from, from Matthew chapter 11 as Jesus spoke these words. Come to me, 
all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's pray.